go ahead and begin anyway. And uh, thanks for joining us for Monday, Thursday service. And it should be a good time. It's good to see those faces. And uh, let me begin by praying. Can we please? So, Father, we thank you so much that we have come together as a church family online. Thank you that we can see one another's faces for this amazing technology. Thank you for keeping us healthy and well and being able to come, whether by phone or by pad or computer. And thank you, Lord, for this amazing week, Lord, that reminds us of what your son went through on this earth for us and the gift that you gave to us. We honor you tonight. We give praise to you, to you and the Son and the Spirit, Lord, for being our our friends, our lords, and we pray that tonight will be a great time of just celebrating and remembering what you did for us this Thursday night, and particularly focusing on the mandates that Jesus, you gave to us on that night in the upper room. So bless us as we join together as a church in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we actually get into the mandates, let me just bring us up to speed on what happened tonight leading up to uh, this time, and I think most of you know that, but you can just listen. Passion Week began on Sunday with Palm Sunday, the entrance of the King, and we have celebrated that. Jesus was staying in Bethany with his friends Nicodemus, Mary, and Martha, which is only about two miles or even less from Jerusalem, an easy walk in and out. And pretty much every day, the scripture seems to indicate that he came into Jerusalem uh, doing a number of things, but mostly teaching. And even though he was a price on his head, to be killed, he came in knowing that it wasn't his time and that he wouldn't be taken yet because uh, he knew all things. And the main teaching that he did was the Olivet Discourse, we call it, which was uh, given uh, on Wednesday, uh, probably on Thursday, when he, in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, gave great prophecies of what would happen at the end time. Judas had conspired already with the Jewish leaders to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, and so the die had been cast that uh, there was diff literally a price on Jesus' head. And uh, Thursday morning, Jesus sends Peter and John, says Luke, to uh, prepare the Passover meal. Now understand that Passover was on Friday, but Passover by Jewish reckoning had already begun. Remember, the day begins on the evening before at sundown. It's now sundown here, or just about sundown here. And it was sundown there when the disciples uh, gathered. So it was already Passover, the day that the lamb was to be slain on Friday, our, our reckoning. And so he sends Peter and John to prepare the Passover meal. And you remember that their instructions that every one of the Gospels gives, that they were to follow, find a man carrying a water jug. That's an interesting clue. And to follow him, they would, that he would lead them to a, the owner of a house that already had an upper room reserved for the meal. We assume that somehow Jesus had already prepared that ahead of time, and, had, and he was giving them instructions, or perhaps by his uh, omniscience, he knew that that would be the case. But nonetheless, Peter and John find that, and it says that they prepared the Passover meal for all the disciples. That would be more than the 12. It says the 12 plus other disciples, so there would have been others that would have been invited, as well as probably a servant or two. So the evening begins, which is, again, actually Passover, having begun on Thursday evening. And the scriptures say that Jesus reclined at the table with the twelve and some other apostles that are not mentioned by name. And he says at the very outset, the Gospels say, he says, With yearning I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you that I will not eat of it any more until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then at the beginning of the evening, he takes the first cup. There were three cups that were taken during the Passover meal. The first cup that he takes, which is not the communion cup, but the first cup of Passover, he gives thanks and says, take this and pass it among yourselves, or divide it among yourselves, depending upon the version you see. And he says, uh, pass it among yourself, for I say to you that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the coming of the kingdom of God. So again, he's preparing them to know that this is something at the end of his life, that this is a significant evening. Supper commences, and they eat the Passover meal. And then Jesus does something very unexpected in the middle or right toward the beginning of the meal, something that gives them the first of the three mandates of the night. And Jesus, uh, well, he takes a towel and wraps it around himself. And at this point, I'm going to unmute uh, Drew, I'm trying to see where he is on my list here. 
you're on there somewhere. And Drew's gonna take us through the first of the mandates. Hang on, let's see, I have Kawiki family, but uh, Drew, hang on. It's not Kawiki family that I wanna give, I don't think. James, phone, Gail, Fire, Ed, Dove, Diana, Daniel, who is it? Am hmm. I there? Oh, I, I see Andrea Kawiki, that's different. Is Kawiki family who you are? Oh, I see you now. Okay. Good. Can you hear Drew? Can you guys hear me? Thumbs up. Okay. Very yeah. good. You can be heard. Good deal. All right. All right. We're going to be reading out of John chapter 13, starting in verse 3. So hopefully you have a Bible nearby. And maybe as you're reaching for that, remember uh, the scene that they're at the Last Supper, and they're at a table called the Triclinium which isn't kind of sitting upright like we usually do at the dinner table. This is a lower table, more, more like a coffee table, and it would be more U-shaped. And they would have kind of pillows on the ground, and you'd be leaning on your left arm, using your right hand to just jam food in your face. And your feet would be kind of hanging out behind you, and they're very prevalent in regards to the people serving the table that these feet would be in everyone's way. And as we're all very aware of right now with germs that cling to us, that feet can be very dirty things, uh, especially if you're from an oriental culture. You're very used to uh, removing your shoes before you come into the house. Well, in the Eastern culture, they did the same thing where they were removing their sandals as they came in. But remember that there had been a big discussion about who was the greatest and who would be the greatest among them. And even John and James sent their mother in to kind of do the work for them. And, hey, will you give my sons a seat at your right hand and left hand? So there's a lot of posturing amongst the apostles right now. And they were unwilling to take that place of washing each other's feet. So Jesus seeing this, he's going to live out a parable to them. Most parables are a word, a picture, but Jesus is going to live out a parable in front of them. So John chapter 13, verse 3, it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. So the first thing that Jesus did was to be aware. He knew he was aware of the need. Whether he saw the need or maybe he smelled the need, there was a need to be met. And he was aware of it. And he removed himself from the place of comfort. He was sitting at the table. He was comfortable. But yet he knew he wanted to serve the apostles and show them example. In the same way, if you look at the big picture, Jesus left the comfort of heaven, comfort of eternity with his father. And he went away from that comfort to be a servant here on the earth, left that place of rest to serve us. Well, next it says in verse five, after that, he poured water into a, a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which he was girded. So he took a big towel, wrapped it around his waist. He was girded with that. So he was ready to take care of business, ready to work. And in the same way, Jesus laid aside his heavenly, he heavenly garment, and he came ready to work, ready to take care of what needed to happen here on the earth so we might have a relationship reconciled with him. Verse 6, it says, Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing... What I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. So here, Peter, always doing what Peter does, kind of uh, being ruffling feathers and sometimes putting his foot in his mouth. He wants to resist this attempt of Jesus to wash his feet, which is appropriate. He knew how uh, wonderful and that Jesus was deity himself. So how could he have his Lord and his soon-to-be Savior washing his feet? So he's having a problem with this. Verse 8, it says, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. 
And what is so necessary is we have to connect with the Savior. Without him washing us through the blood on the cross, we will have no part of him. And so we need to be connected in that way. Verse 9, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And what an interesting thing, a man given to extremes. No, don't wash me at all. Then give me a full bath. I like that because I kind of identify with that. If I don't kind of get it my way on one end of the spectrum, I go directly to the other end. So I can really identify with Peter in that way. But Jesus continues to say to him in verse 10, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. So here the idea is that Jesus was going to do the ultimate cleaning on the cross. That's what cleans us up um, from head to toe that takes away our sin. But what is necessary is we as Christians, as we walk through the earth, we get dirty feet. We get tripped up in sin. Uh, we fall into potholes along the way that trip us up. And we just need to get back to that First John 1-9 passage. That What does it say? It says, if we confess our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, the Christian bar of soap. So here, giving us a spiritual example that Jesus needs to continually be washing us in that sense of our confession and he will forgive us. But the ultimate cleansing comes as he goes to the cross. But here he shows us that we need to be an example and we need to take care of others in our lives and in our church. So he continues in verse 12. It says, When he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. Most assuredly, I say, a servant is no greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. So Jesus being very emphatic, being very upfront and transparent, this is an example of what we're supposed to do for each other. And that's not merely to have a Monday, Thursday foot washing ceremony. He's talking about taking care of one another, taking that place of a servant, getting your hands dirty, girding a, you know, a cloth along your waist to do the hard work. Now, a couple examples of this. One, I think one of a modern day example of washing someone's feet is helping them move. It's a very humbling experience. You leave your house, uh, your house of comfort, you go to someone else's house and you know, out. Um, you know, they're taking up their bed, you start moving their dresser, you start seeing all the dust and things that have been hidden ears in people's corners and closets. And truly, it's a way to serve others and to bless them. And even a current example of that is going out and getting groceries for someone who's in need. Talk about putting yourself in harm's way, getting around some germs, uh, being aware of dirtiness, but taking, in a sense, the risk and taking advantage of the opportunity to serve someone else in that manner. Of course, we want to be wise. Uh, we don't want to be belligerent running into situations that are dangerous, but this is one way that we can serve one another by washing each other's feet. And the last verse I'd like you to see is verse 17. John 13, 17. This is the crux of the matter. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So the idea is not just knowing them, being educated about them, uh, having a heart to do it, or just having the desire to do it. God does know that and acknowledge it, but it's actually you will be blessed when you do it. So please, find opportunities. Let's all find opportunities to serve one another. We can do that through prayer, um, but there are going to be plenty of sacrificial opportunities for us to get our hands dirty and serve one another. So let's do that. All right, Craig, take over. Thank you, Drew. That was excellent. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we know that there's three mandates. Uh, we've already looked at the first one uh, 
of service that God wants to serve one another. And then we'll be looking next at communion. And then lastly, at, at the, that we are to love as Christ loved us. Did you know that only the Gospel of John, of all the four Gospels, talk about the foot washing and talk about the mandate of service? No mention of it in, in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. And the same, John is the only one who mentions the mandate of love as I have loved you. So the Gospel of John mentions the first and last mandate. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the ones that mention the communion. And John doesn't mention communion. Isn't that interesting? So again, we need to combine. We need to have all four of the uh, authors that help us to understand there was three mandates that night and get the fullness of what actually happened. After the foot washing and before the memorial bread and cup, let me tell you what happens in the scripture. Jesus warns of his betrayal by one of the 12. You remember that story. And Judas is there in the room, and he says it's the one to whom he gives the morsel when he has dipped it. He takes a morsel, probably of bread, and dips it in some cup, and he gives it to Judas. And it says in the scripture that Satan enters in to Judas at that point. Now, Satan was certainly controlling Judas uh, before that or pointing to him in the fact that he had already gone to the Pharisees to, to uh, arrange for 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. But what was it to have Satan actually enter into him? What a scary thought that Judas was so far gone, so far away from the Lord, that Satan actually was able to enter him. And from that point on, Judas was controlled by Satan in the same way that we as Christians are controlled by the Holy Spirit. It says that uh, the other disciples seem not to be sure of what is happening. They don't, even though he's saying he gives the morsel to Judas, they don't really seem to pick that up. And then he says to Judas, does Jesus, what are you doing? Whatever you're doing, do quickly. Do it quickly. But the other disciples think that he's telling Judas, who's the keeper of the money, to go buy something for the feast. I think God was keeping that from the other disciples at that point. But Judas exits. And so communion and the final command and all the rest that happens that evening is done with 11 disciples, 11 of the 12 at least, because Judas goes to betray. And we know that later when they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, they see Judas again coming to kiss Jesus. Well, at that point, after Jesus exits, the meal is basically over. And the disciples are ready to say, it's, it's done, isn't it? We're, we've, we've had the Passover meal. And, and then something strange happens. Jesus again picks up a piece of bread, it says. He says he takes bread now, did he pick up some of the bread that was just left over from the meal? Possibly. It says he broke it, which gives the impression that it was a full piece of bread, perhaps, or a larger piece that hadn't been broken yet. But I, I've often wondered if it might have been a very special piece of bread. You know, typically for the Seder meal or the Passover meal that was being taken, they had a place set for Elijah. And, of course, Elijah was to come, and Jesus was the ultimate Messiah. Elijah that would come. And they were always wondering if Elijah might come in the door, that the Messiah might come back and take his place at the meal. And possibly, we don't know this for sure, it doesn't say so in the scripture, but possibly Jesus really surprised the apostles and the disciples there in the room by taking the bread that was set for Elijah. Imagine how that would have shaken their, their feelings and their spiritual heart and said, what is he doing? What is he doing? But either way, he took bread and he gave thanks and he breaks the bread and divides it among the disciples. And as he's doing that, sharing pieces and having them share it around this, this table that they were set at, he says, take, eat. Now, of course, that's a command that you say, that's an, of course, I'm supposed to eat bread if I get it. But he says, I want you to eat this. And then he says, this is my body, which is given for you. And I want to make a particular point that what he doesn't say is this is my body which is broken for you. I know he broke the bread, but many times people misunderstand that he doesn't say this is my body which was broken because as you know, his body wasn't broken on the cross. When the soldiers were supposed to break his bones to see if he was, had dead, he was already dead and they didn't have to break his body. His body was whole when he gave it for us, the perfect sacrifice on the cross. So take ye, this is my body which is given for you, and do this in remembrance of me. That would have been confusing to them because we, post 
all this understand that we're remembering his death, we're remembering his resurrection, remembering his life, but he was still alive and he hadn't died yet. He hadn't given his body yet, but he says, this is my body, which is given for you. I wonder if some of the disciples were beginning, beginning to think about the many times that he had prophesied that when he went to Jerusalem, he would die. And that his body would be given. It hadn't quite hit them yet. They certainly hadn't hit yet that he'd be raised from the dead, even though he predicted that as well. But he says, this is my body, which is given for you. It would have been a surprise. It would have broken the traditional ritual of Passover to take bread once again. They had already eaten bread for the meal. Now, from our recent study of Colossians, those of you that have been with us, we learned that Jesus' fleshly body was identified with reconciliation. I want, I want to recall with you what it says in Colossians chapter 2. Paul was teaching, and he says, You were formerly alienated from God and hostile in mind, engaged in evil, yet Jesus has now reconciled you in his fleshly body. That's the phrase that stands out to me so strongly. He has reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. So we see that reconciliation, which is, of course, man being brought to God, being brought back together. We were separated. We were hostile. We were uh, alienated and that we couldn't come to him because of sin. Now through his body. Why the body? Because the body was the sacrifice. The body was the perfect lamb of God, just as the lambs of centuries past covered or atoned for the sin temporarily. Jesus' body was going to cause the reconciliation, bringing us close to God as never before was possible. So the body of Christ is to remind us specifically that the sacrifice of his earthly body accomplished you being able to be reconciled with God, brought near to him as never could be before. Again, his body was not broken, but whole. And we are wholly healed. We are wholly reconciled. The Lamb of God. All the lambs that were offered by the Old Testament priests were not broken either. They were slaughtered. And Jesus was slaughtered or given. He wasn't broken. To accomplish reconciliation. So as we take bread together, can you get your elements that you have there, whether it's a cracker or a bread or... Or maybe a sandwich. I don't know what you have. I have a Ritz cracker. Joanne and I have a Ritz cracker here. I'm going to get up and give her hers. hers. And we can partake in communion together. Let's see your elements. You see them up the camera so you can see what you have there. Something. Those of you who are on the phone, we can't see that, whatever. But whatever kind of bread it is, it's a memorial. And I want to remind us that not only are we to do this in remembrance of him, meaning looking backwards, but it also says in the scriptures that we do this in anticipation of his coming in a resurrected body for us. We are to also remember that he's coming. So we have the perspective of both looking back in remembrance and looking forward in anticipation that someday our bodies will be resurrected because his body was given for us. So let us remember him and anticipate his coming together. Amen. Lord, bless our time as we celebrate communion by taking this bread. And we do it in remembrance of you, dear Lord. Drew's going to come on now and help us through the second element of the cup. Well, wine is always a symbol of joy and celebration within the Bible. It was there to uh, have feast days, days that would honor God, that would celebrate him. And just Jesus makes this great correlation at this point from wine to blood, that he is symbolizing that wine as the blood that will be shed on the cross. And the shedding of blood is nothing new in regards to the Old Testament and to Jews. They're very, very aware that much blood needs to be shed for the covering over of sin. That's what the Passover meal was all about, that the Jewish people would gather a lamb into their home for about two weeks. 
that they would become somewhat attached to that lamb and then they would need to sacrifice that lamb to let out its blood to cover the doorposts of their home so that the angel of death would pass over. You often have heard about a scarlet thread that runs throughout the Bible. So that scarlet thread truly is emblematic of the blood of Jesus that will be shed on the next day. So he, in Matthew chapter 26, in verse 27, begins to take that cup and that symbolic uh, idea of what he will do in the future. Now, me coming from a Catholic background, they believe in transubstantiation when there is the sacrament of communion within the church. But yet, we don't see Jesus doing that kind of transformation where he's taking this wine and making it into his own blood, or it could have just been poured out of the cup right there, and that would have been enough. No, he's setting the minds of the apostles forward to what will be happening the next day. So in verse 27 of Matthew 26, Matthew 26, 27, it says, Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And this idea of the remission of sins, it, may, it means to take sin and do away with it completely, as if it never happened. With the blood of bulls and goats, it can merely cover over sin. And in fact, maybe you've had to... Uh, um, sweep your living room floor before and you just lift up the rug and sweep everything under the rug, right? Is that the common term? And that's how sin was. Sin was swept under the rug for a period of time, but it was never completely dealt with until Jesus shed his blood on the cross. We know that from the book of Hebrews. It says that the shedding of bulls and goats could never remove sin. It was only by the precious blood of Jesus that that could happen. And uh, if you wouldn't mind turning over to Colossians, hopefully you're getting pretty aware of where Colossians is since we've been there. But I thought we'd just do a little quick review. What we talked about, it's been about four weeks now. But Colossians chapter 2, verses 13. So it's good for us to remember this, that Paul put it in a way that, that lays out a very nice word picture for us. So Colossians 2.13, it says, And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So we remember we talked about that white board, and that truly Jesus and his blood is the eraser that takes away every ordinance, every sin that we have committed, and everything that we didn't fulfill that maybe God has called us to do or any rules of regulations of the Old Testament, where we have fallen short, God's blood, Jesus' blood, bridges that gap. So we are so thankful for that. And so we're thankful for his blood. And remember, it's the propitiation. It's the payment for sin. So the body was, in a sense, there to bring harmony with us in God, that we were in conflict with God, and now we're brought back into harmony through his body. But the debt, the price that had to be paid came through the blood. And the body and blood work together. Harmony and forgiveness. Oh, we are reunited with God and there's nothing that can hinder us from that union. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Because the body and the blood has been shed on the cross, broken on the cross. And we are in good standing with God. So if you have your cup... Please grab your cup. So I will pray for us and then we'll have the cup together. So dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your son. Thank you, Jesus, 
for leaving the comfort of heaven and girding on human, a human body and girding on the clothing of being a servant and that you would humble yourself even to the point of the cross and that you would die that shameful death for us and that your blood would be spilled for us so that we could have the forgiveness of our sins. We cannot pay you. We cannot return enough works to value the blood that was shed. The only thing we can do is receive it by faith. And so right now, we take the cup and we receive it by faith that it was shed for each of us individually. And we take it and we acknowledge it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Craig. The taste is always sweet, isn't it? Whether you're having juice or maybe some of you are having milk, I don't know, or water. But the sweetness has little to do with the beverage and everything to do with what God has done through redemption. Well, after the communion, the one thing that happens before the third and final mandate is something that is really quite surprising. You'd think that after Jesus had humbled himself and washed their feet, had explained the importance of being a servant to one another, after he had surprised them by taking the bread and the cup, possibly from Elijah's place, but either way, surprising them that there was something after the meal that was a remembrance of what would be his death for them, that they would be humbled, that they would be sweet in spirit, the very next thing that the scripture says happens sadly shows our humanity. And the next thing that happens is immediately after the communion, there arose a contention among the disciples as to who is thought to be the greatest. It, 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 it humbles me and it, it shames me to realize that that's who I am, that that's who we are. That even in the midst of being taught the importance of servanthood, and the importance of remembering what Jesus was to do, that sometimes our minds so wander that we're more concerned about ourselves. Jesus quells that contention by saying this specifically. Listen, he says, Let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and he who leads as one who serves. For which of you is the greater? He who reclines at dinner or he who is serving? Now, he actually gave him a riddle right there. Normally, what would be the answer to that? Well, the one who reclines at dinner would be the greater one because the one who would be serving is the servant. But he said, would you not say it's the one who reclines? And they're thinking, yes, that's the right answer to your question, master. But he then he says, ah, but I am in your midst as the one who serves. And he left it open for them to understand who then is the greater. Is it, is it me, Jesus, or is it you, the disciples? And in this specific case, they, they would understand that he was the greater, the one who served. And then again, they were hopefully humbled. What's interesting is that John, as I said before, which picks up the story of the third mandate, says the next thing that Jesus said with little children, this is in verse 33 of chapter 13, if you wanted to follow along. But it's in John only where Jesus says, little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. And boy, did that get their minds going. Did that get them going? Now, at that, that moment, John doesn't record them saying, where are you going, where are you going? But that happens right after. He apparently keeps going quick enough that they don't have a chance to say what they're thinking. Where are you going? But the next thing he says is the third mandate. And he says, it's in verse 34 of John 13. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And then he followed that by saying, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have this love for one another. So let's examine that for a moment that would not have surprised them to say, disciples, I want you to love one another. It would not have surprised them because that was a command from the Old Testament that was given through Moses. 
We can look in the Old Testament in a number of places that we are told that we need to love one another, love God and love others. In fact, that was the, the great commandment. Remember when Jesus was asked, what are the greatest commandments? Well, to love one another and love your neighbor as yourself. We're to love one another. So that wasn't the new commandment. But the new twist that he adds to that, the new commandment I'm giving you that you love as I have loved you. In other words, I have given you, he's saying to them, the ultimate example of love that you never knew from Moses. You never knew from the prophets. You never knew from the teachers of the law, of the Israeli law. You never even learned it for completely from your parents if they were good parents. But I, as your Lord, who has lived among you now for these years that we've been together, you have seen me love you in a divine way, in a way that no one else has ever loved. And so I was beginning to think, as I want you to think with me, how did Jesus love them that he wants us to love one another? Well, the first thing I think of immediately is that he accepted them. He accepted a, a loudmouthed fisherman. He accepted a sinful tax collector, an overzealot zealot that thought it was all about uh, Rome and not about conquering sin. He accepted each of the disciples one by one, whatever their background, whatever their ethnicity. Now, they were all Jews. But he's teaching us also that we need to accept one another. We love one another so that anybody that walks into our church, we don't look at the color of their skin or the, the age or their background or their clothing. James reminded us of that. Remember the brother of James when he wrote his, his, his book? He said, now, if anyone walks into your church, you know, you don't tell this one to sit in the back and this one to sit in the front. It's a lack of prejudice, folks. In an age when prejudice still exists, in all of us to some degree, we are to love as Jesus did without prejudice, who's willing to love the prostitute, who's willing to love the leper, who's willing to love the prisoner, who's willing to love the downcast, the blind and the lame, who's willing to take the children in his lap and say, these children know more about heaven than you do, adults. By their mouths, they teach us what we should learn in humility and simplicity of faith. So the first thing, as I have loved you, reminds me that we're to be accepting of one another. I want you to think in your mind as I talk with you, someone that you particularly struggle with maybe loving, in the, in maybe even in our church or certainly in the body of Christ. Can you accept them as Jesus did? Can you go to them as he went to Zacchaeus and say, come down from that tree and come into my house? I'll come to your house, I could said. Or can you accept them like the leper who, who everyone else shunned that leper, but you went up and you can give that person a hug and say, I love you in the love of Jesus? Or to go up the blind man that everyone else was saying, he can't see, he's not worth your time. And he said, let me go to him. And he touches him and heals him. Can we accept people that way? That's a difficult thing when you think about it, to love and accept as Jesus accepted. The second thing I think of when I think of how Jesus loved them in the way that no one else had before is Jesus forgave them. Now, we just took the cup, which is all about forgiveness. But Jesus forgave Matthew and forgave Peter and forgave John and forgave Thomas for his doubting and forgave each of them, each of the disciples for their weakness. He forgave Mary Magdalene for her many nights of prostitution, and on and on and on, and he forgave completely. You remember the story of the man that was let down through the roof while Jesus was teaching, and, and Jesus says, I forgive your sins, and the Pharisees were so incensed because they were saying, who can forgive sins? But God, you can't do that. And then Jesus says, because you know that I have authority as the Son of God to forgive sins, I say to you, take up your bed and walk, and he walked. But the great miracle that day was that he forgave that man his sins, and he at one point walked into that room or was led into that room by his friends as one who was going to hell. But he walked out of that room as one who was going to heaven because Jesus had the ability to forgive. Can we forgive people that way? Forgiveness is not, saying, not just saying, oh, I forgive you, and then acting the same toward them. 
forgiveness in my book is acting as if it hasn't happened. Now, that doesn't mean it hasn't. There still may be consequence. There still may be hurt. There still may be pain. But we treat them with the respect and love as if it hasn't happened. It's not as if the sin has been swept under the wet rug, as Drew just used that example, but as if that sin didn't even happen in the way that we treat them. You know, one thing Drew and I mention every now and then in our meetings together is that as pastors, one of the joys is we get to know the best of you. One of the sad things is we get sometimes to know the worst of you. And I know some of your backgrounds and sins, and you know what? I forgive those, and we forgive those. And when you learn things about people, we're hurt and we're struck. And if nothing else, we should be struck that we have the same tendency. We're sinners too. We all have the same prone disability. It's called sin. We need to learn, as Jesus did, to forgive one another so that we can treat one another as if that didn't happen. Now, you and God are going to have to work on that sin. You're going to have to let go of those, those sins one at a time. And it may be our responsibility as we hold each other accountable to point out sin lovingly, but we still forgive even as we hold one another accountable. And we don't hold it against them. For after all, it's not our right to hold it against them. Only God can hold it against. So I, I want us to love by accepting by forgiving, and think of someone that you just struggle to forgive. Someone's going to come to mind. Someone already has come to mind. You need to say, Lord, help me to forgive that person. I forgive them in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to treat them as if that sin hadn't happened, whether to me or one that I've heard about that they've done. Jesus accepted and he forgave, and I, I just want to add one more. We could, we could talk about it all night. But he believed in them. You remember 1 Corinthians 13 where it says love is patient, love is kind, and love is all these things. At the very end of that list in 1 Corinthians 13, he says love believes the best. Oh, does Jesus believe the best about me? And I'm so glad he does. Jesus believes the best about you. He sees the potential that you have to be that perfect person that you're going to be in heaven. That when sin totally is erased, you will be sinless. He sees the best in you, and I believe he wants us to see the best in one another. When we look at someone that, that is broken, that is hurt, that is not whole, and that is all of us, we're all in process, we see, as the optimist does, the best in that person, the potential in that person, what that person would be like if they could just give up that sin, that addiction, that hurt, that hurtful way. Can we see people that way? Can we, can we believe the best about them? That doesn't mean that they don't still hurt us or there isn't still a problem. They're working on some things. We're all in process, folks. So just think about those three things. Those are the three that I was thinking about as I prepared for this tonight. That as I have loved you is to be accepting, is to be forgiving, and is to be believing in that person. If we can do that to one another, you know what will happen? What Jesus said the world will see in that kind of divine love that we are his disciples and that Jesus just might be worth following if that's what he'll do to a heart. So again, think about that one or more that you struggle with accepting or forgiving or believing in and ask God's help to begin to accept and forgive and believe by his grace. And I believe that people will begin to see you more as his disciple. For that's what Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have this kind of love for one another. Well, let's just finish up by just reminding ourselves of what else happened that evening. After those three mandates, the mandate of service, the mandate of communion and remembering him that way, and the mandate of loving one another as he is loved, there was the prophecy of Peter's three denials. Peter says, I will do everything for you. I'll never deny you. And Jesus said, oh, before the cock crows three times, Peter, tonight you're going to deny me. How that crushed him. Be careful how often you tell the Lord, I'm yours. I'm yours, Lord, forever and forever. Because right around the corner, we're going to stumble. But Jesus is there to forgive and accept and believe the best in you. 
Then we have Jesus saying, let not your heart be troubled. And he begins that upper room discourse that we know so well in John chapter 14, 15, and 16. Let not be your heart be troubled. And after, after he tells all these things of the Spirit and gives this wonderful discourse, they go out and they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And the rest of the night is cast as Judas comes up and betrays him and he's taken into the hands of the authorities. This is the night of Monday, Thursday, the night of the mandate. And I hope that maybe in a fresh way, Drew and I have helped you to understand through the scriptures the importance of these three mandates, because they weren't just mandates for the 12, for the apostles that were in that room. They're mandates by extension to you and to me. The mandate to serve, to take up our towel, as it were, to lay aside our greatness, such as it is, the little greatness we have, and to serve one another in humility, as Jesus did us and did the disciples that night. And secondly, that we continually remember we continually take the bread and continually take the cup and continually memorialize what happened. That never grows old for we as Christians. And we continue to remember what's coming and anticipate that he's coming back to make us perfect through that body that was given to us and through the blood that was shed for us. So we challenge you to let this night be a special night. Remember, Passover has already begun. Friday in the Jewish reckoning is already here. It happened at sundown. And today, in the Jewish reckoning, he's going to die for you. So celebrate tomorrow, Good Friday, with the remembrance of the mandates of Monday, Thursday. So I'm going to unmute us at this point, And uh, you try to be quiet there for a moment, okay? Because Drew's going to pray for us as we close. All right, Brother Drew? And then as soon as Drew says amen, we can all say goodbye to one another and talk for a little while before I close the meeting, all right? Hope it's been a good time. Just one little word of announcement, and that is that this has gone so well. By the way, in case you're curious, there's been 31 of us that have come in. There was 56 invitations. 32 is not bad. Two-thirds or so came on. So 32 of us are either listening in or watching in. That's pretty exciting. And we're going to do the same thing on Easter morning. So tomorrow, Good Friday, uh, we're going to send out another invitation to you that you'll have that you'll do the same thing. You can either come in by phone or you can come in by by iPad or by, by phone with a, a smartphone, or best, you can come in by computer if you happen to have one. We're going to gather at 10 o'clock, which is our service time, on Sunday morning. I'm going to offer a little bit of music. We can't sing together, although you can maybe sing with this. We're going to have a message uh, for you, an Easter resurrection message. Drew's going to do a body life with us in a prayer time. So it's going to be kind of like a service, as best we can online anyway. So anticipate that. Save 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. And if anybody else wants to be invited to join us, by the way, you need to give me their email. I'm glad to invite them in, but nobody's going to be invited except the Oaks family unless one of you, you know, emails me and tells, that, tells me that somebody else wants to be invited. <coughs> so that's the commercial. Okay, I'm unmuting you all now. Don't be noisy. Don't be noisy. All right, be quiet for a moment while Drew prays for us. All right, then we can talk. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the encouragement uh, that, yes, you love us. You paid the price for us. You want us to serve. You want us to truly love and forgive one another in the same way that we have been forgiven. And like we'll read in a couple weeks in Colossians, that freely Christ forgave us, so freely we must forgive others. But tomorrow we remember that the forgiveness was not free to you, Jesus, that you paid the ultimate price, that you gave your life. And thank you so much for doing that. It tells us in Romans that God demonstrated his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you for loving us that way and help us to love one another in the same way that we be willing to lead out our lives and serve one another. So oh, please do that in Jesus' name. Amen.